tonight. Who is our speaker is Wilson Pritchard, Professor Wilson Pritchard of the Political Science Department, but you're really an economist, right? No, you're not an economist. <laughs> you're doing the po political science of, of taxation. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that is uh, extremely important, obviously. And uh, um, there was a, a book a friend of mine wrote a num number of years ago called Good Taxes. And I thought that was a wonderful title because, you know, I don't think anybody looks forward to taxes, but we have have to have taxes, and some of them are very benign. So it's a pleasure. Um, Professor Pritchard uh, um, works at uh, sometimes at the uh, University of Sussex in Britain, and you did your PhD at Harvard, was it? Uh, undergrad at Harvard. Undergrad at Harvard. Where did you do your PhD? At Sussex. At Sussex. Okay, so very good. You must travel across the ocean quite a bit. A fair bit, yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, I, he's a, an expert on international taxation, and he's uh, going to share his thought with us. Wilson Pritchard. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Meta and everyone, uh, for being here this evening and for inviting me uh, to speak today, uh, tonight. Um, my topic tonight, as you can see, uh, is international taxation, global inequalities, and development. Uh, and much as people don't look forward to taxes, my experience is that people also rarely look forward to talks about taxation, uh, which tends to fall into the category of the dull and the technical and the inaccessible. Uh, so part of my goal tonight is obviously just going to be to convince you that these issues are indeed important, that they are indeed interesting, uh, and critically that they are indeed also accessible uh, and understandable to a sort of broad audience. Um, I'm not an economist by training, but the research I'll present sort of falls at the intersection of political science, economics, and the law. Uh, and I'm not an expert in any of those things, but hopefully by bringing them together, I'll be able to say something uh, at least reasonably useful. Uh, and as I do that, uh, I want to sort of highlight three broad themes that I hope will sort of come out of the talk as we move forward. Um, the first is that I think international taxation is what we might think of as one of these hidden issues that we don't talk about much, we don't see much about, it's hard to participate in, it happens at the global level, but which is deeply important for national and global development. Right? And so it's sort of trying to cast a light on a set of issues that I think are frequently overlooked, but really deserve much more attention than they tend to get. Uh, the second thing is to really highlight the politics that shapes global inequalities and the particular international rules that exist at the global level. Right? That politics is really important to think about where we are now, but also how reform happens, and also the limits and challenges of reform. And I hope that will come through in what I say tonight. Uh, and finally, I want to say a bit about the complexity of arriving at those global solutions and what some forward progress on international tax might look like, but also so what some alternative options might look like where international processes of reform fail, particularly as it relates to low-income countries. Uh, I should say that my particular background is in studying international development, particularly in Africa. So that's where my key focus is, where my key expertise is. Uh, but I am going to talk about international taxation tonight in a more global sense of the word and as it relates to a wider range of countries. Uh, so that is the broad plan. Uh, and in terms of an outline, what I'm going to try to do is uh, what I used to do in sort of my activist days, which is what my identity was before becoming academic. Uh, and it's sort of in the mode of a teach-in, right? Sort of go over from beginning to end. So the first thing I'd like to do is convince you that these issues are important and why they're important. Once I hopefully get you sort of a little bit hooked in and you care about these issues, I then want to say a bit more sort of technically about how it actually works, right? How does international tax evasion and avoidance happen in practice? And once we've understood how those systems work, to then say a bit more about what kind of reform has been attempted already, where that's succeeding, where it's failing, and what might then come next in moving this agenda forward. Uh, so I hope you will stay with me through that whole agenda. It's unusual to be asked to talk for an hour. Uh, it's unusual that people will sit and listen to you talk for an hour, uh, but I'm going to try and seize that opportunity uh, and walk you through uh, the whole of what I think this agenda looks like. Um, so I want to start, though, just with the really big picture, right? What exactly is it that we're talking about here? Uh, and if I boil it right down to a few words, uh, this is what I'd say. Uh, we're talking about a system of international tax rules that has existed for a very long time and has been coordinated by the OECD in particular. That system of international tax rules, not necessarily intentionally, uh, but by design or not, has allowed large shares of personal wealth and corporate profits to be shifted offshore. Uh, that is what we often call tax haven secrecy jurisdictions. And once that wealth and profit has been shifted into those offshore jurisdictions, it's been almost impossible for national governments to tax it effectively. That's because of a combination of low rates of tax in those places and official secrecy 
that has allowed those profits and that wealth to be hidden from the view of national governments who have then been unable to tax it effectively. Right? That's the core of the story we're talking about, is about this process of wealth and profit moving offshore to the detriment of national governments. And when we think about that story, this is the image that I think tends to come to mind for a lot of people, right? That they're beautiful Caribbean island, that's the Cayman Islands or the British Virgin Islands or Bermuda. Um, and that's certainly part of our story. That's part of the network of tax havens that we're talking about when we talk about international tax rules. But I think it's really important to stress right now up front before we get started that that's not what the whole story is about, right? Those Car Caribbean islands are part of that story, but equally important are these other places. This is an office building in the U.S. state of Delaware. It has more registered companies in there than you have in most states individually in the whole state, right? Because this is where companies and individuals regi register anonymous shell companies, which they then use to avoid taxes around the world, right? That's part of our story. This is the city of London, which has long been implicated in all kinds of forms of profit shifting and tax avoidance around the world, which has also exercised authority over a lot of British dependencies which are those same Caribbean islands involved in this network, right? It's also a story about anonymous bank accounts or secret bank accounts in Switzerland, about investment vehicles in Luxembourg, and a whole host of other tax structures that exist in OECD countries and non-OECD countries. But I think it's important to remember this isn't a story about Caribbean islands. This is a global system that has arisen in order to assist various groups of individuals and corporations to avoid taxes around the world. So why then does this matter? Right. I'm going to suggest to you that this matters in three broad kinds of ways. Uh, one, and most obviously, is the failures of international tax rules tend to undermine national tax revenues and the ability then to fund key social services and public goods. But it's not just about raising tax revenues. It's also about global inequality. It's about how we measure inequality and how inequality spreads and expands around the world. And it's also about regulation, crime, and corruption because the same structures of secrecy that have facilitated tax avoidance and evasion are the structures that have also facilitated crime, terrorist financing, high-level corruption, and has made it harder and harder for national governments to regulate national economies. And so let me talk a bit more about each of those things in turn in trying to convince you that these are issues that, in fact, you should care a lot about. And I'll start by talking about the role of individuals in this story. Right? Because we're talking about individuals shifting wealth offshore in order to avoid taxes. But how big a problem is that, really? Well, official estimates, and there are more and more of these that are arising, suggest that the scale of wealth held offshore by the world's very wealthy is somewhere between about $10 trillion and $30 trillion held offshore. Right? That's not billion, that's trillion. Right? These are huge sums of money that are held offshore. The most conservative estimates, but also probably the best estimates, come from a professor out in California named Gabriel Zuckman, and he estimated that at a very minimum, 8% of all household wealth in the world is held in offshore forms, and at least 20% of all global securities, that is stocks and bonds and the like, are all held offshore. And again, I stress, those are lower bound estimates. He suggests that the reality must be much, much larger, but it's at least that much, right? And when we talk about these assets held offshore, we're talking about bank accounts, we're talking about stocks and bonds. We're talking about real estate held offshore outside the reach of tax authorities. We're also talking about artwork, jewelry, and other luxury kinds of goods, all the ways in which people might store wealth offshore, which appreciates over time. But critically to our story, and particularly to the stories I study, is that this problem is even worse for low-income countries, right? So 8% of all household wealth is estimated to be offshore, but 20% of all the wealth held by households in Latin America. 30% of all household wealth held in Africa, 50% or more in Russia and the Gulf states. And again, I stress, those are lower bound estimates of the wealth that's held offshore. It's probably more. And I would stress further, not everyone holds 50% of their wealth offshore, right? It's only the very, very, very wealthiest who, held wealth, who hold their wealth offshore, right? So it may be that 8% of all household wealth is held offshore, but that might be 20% of the wealth of the wealthiest people who are the ones who are actually doing it, right? So huge shares of the wealth of the wealthiest are held offshore and it's increasingly clear that that's in fact empirically true. And just to give you one data point to sort of convince you this is real and not a figment of an academic's imagination, a couple of years ago, Indonesia declared a tax amnesty program. This said that if you had disguised revenues from the government for years in the past, you could now declare that revenue and those assets freely to the government 
and they wouldn't charge you back taxes, right? You should kind of come out of the cold and declare all your assets. You don't expect that to get everyone to declare their assets, but you expect that some people will. And over the course of a couple of years, almost $100 billion in offshore wealth were declared to the government, most of it held in Singapore. Right? Let's imagine that's just a fraction of what's actually out there. So what's actually out there could be two, three, four hundred billion dollars of offshore wealth from Indonesia alone. Right? That's pretty consistent with the story I've told you about 10 or 20 or more trillions of dollars held offshore. So what does that mean for national revenues? Well, those lower bound estimates I told you about suggest under simple, pretty simple assumptions that about $200 billion, perhaps more, are lost to national governments every year through their inability to tax that wealth that's held offshore. And again, if we imagine higher estimates, that number might double or more as well. Right? So these are large amounts of revenue. Coming back to the question of how do you pay for global public goods, that's a lot more money than what it's estimated to cost to implement the sustainable development goals, to fund a green transition, and a whole host of other public goods. The story looks very similar for global corporations, right? Recent estimates suggest that the strategies used by global corporations to avoid taxes through loopholes in international tax rules amount to tax losses somewhere on the order of 500 to $650 billion a year. This isn't some sort of fringe conspiracy saying that's true. That's the IMF that says that that's true. Right? So these are widely accepted, increasingly widely accepted figures. They're not precise because these things are, of course, by definition, hidden from view, but it probably gives us a sense of the broad scale of these problems. Right? And again, I would stress what I stressed earlier, this problem is worse for low-income countries. Right? These estimates suggest that it's about twice as large as a share of GDP in low-income countries as compared to OECD countries. And for the worst affected countries, particularly those with mining and oil operations, the sums are larger still, right? So for developing countries, that means that they might be losing as much as 12 or 13 percent of all of tax revenue as a result of these kinds of strategies. But again, in the worst affected countries, it might be significantly larger. And critically, this is a trend that appears to have been increasing over time with the increasing globalization and digitization of economies. And just to give you one example, and this is to bring it sort of close to home here in Canada, this is just a very simple graph. The red line is telling us about the share of outward Canadian investments that are routed through tax haven countries. Right? In 1987, 10% went through tax haven countries. In 2011, that was 25%. Right? And this is the kind of trend we see around the world with more and more investment going through tax havens for a whole host of reasons. But one of those reasons is to try to minimize tax liabilities in the countries in which these companies operate. <clears throat> but this isn't just a question about revenue raising. It's also a broader question about the expansion and measurement of inequality. When it comes to the measurement of inequality, there's a simple message here, right? Our official statistics about inequality, all of which tell us that inequality is rising in most countries in the world, are based on the revenues we know about. They don't consider all that wealth held offshore. If we start considering all the wealth held offshore, we quickly find that countries are even more unequal than we already think that they are, right? Relatively crude estimates suggest that the wealthiest people in the world might be about 50% wealthier than official statistics suggest. If the wealthiest people in the world are 50% wealthier than we thought, that means inequality is correspondingly much worse than we thought. And just to give you a sense very crudely of what that looks like, I've put up this map. This is a map of official estimates of levels of inequality around the world, right? You can see low income or low income inequality in Europe, lighter colors. If we consider the role of tax havens and wealth held offshore, those European countries start looking more like the United States. The United States starts looking more like a place like South Africa with some of the highest inequality in the world. And those countries in Latin America, in Southern Africa, look even worse still. Really, really staggering levels of inequality. Also worth noting, in this map you see, Russia doesn't look that unequal. The Gulf states don't look that unequal. That's not really consistent with what we think is true, and indeed, it's not true, right? Because those are the countries where so much wealth is held offshore that official inequality statistics grossly underestimate the reality on the ground. But it's not just a story also about how we measure inequality, it's also a story about how international tax rules have helped to facilitate the expansion of inequality over time. Right? For high net worth individuals, that is the wealthy people in the world, their ability to take advantage of these tax structures mean that they pay lower taxes at a share of their income 
than people with lower incomes who can't take advantage of the same structures. For large corporations, it means that they pay less, they pay lower effective tax rates than their domestic competitors who can't take advantage of international tax structures to reduce their tax burdens. Right? Both of those things are very inconsistent with basic notions of fairness, basic notions about fair competition between large and small firms, and are consistent with the broader and troubling trends that we see related to inequality around the world. But finally, this is also then a story about regulation and crime and corruption, right? Key to the system I've described to you, a system of international tax rules that has given rise to tax havens, is the idea of secrecy, right? It's the idea that those tax havens will help to obscure corporate activities and individual wealth held offshore. That's good for tax avoidance, but it also has a lot of other certain consequences. One is that it's good for crime and terrorism plan terrorist financing. Right? If you're a criminal and you want to launder money, use exactly the same kinds of structures as the tax avoiders we've talked about so far. If you're a high-level political official and you want to engage in high-level corruption, you use the same structures we've just described to move your money around the world outside the view of national administrations and anti-corruption agencies. And if you're a national regulator wanting to regulate risk within the economy, particularly in the financial sector, it's increasingly been suggested that that job may be harder because of the ability of corporations to hide the riskiest aspects of their business offshore where they're harder to see, right? So there's a whole series of ways in which international tax rules then intersect with some of the big global challenges we face even outside of the realm of revenue raising. And so my hope is that might convince you that these issues are worth caring about. And if I have convinced you that you'll now stick with me for another 40 minutes so I can tell you a bit more about how they work and therefore what might be done about it. And in talking about how these international tax challenges play out in practice, I'm going to talk first about what it looks like in relation to multinational corporations, and then what it looks like in relation to high net worth individuals, because the stories are overlapping but different. And to think about how international tax rules work and how they fail in relation to multinational companies, I think it's useful to start with the basic question which underpins what the international tax system is fundamentally about. And the question is, when an MNC operates across countries around the world, how should we divide up its profits for tax purposes, right? When a, when a multinational operates in all kinds of countries, every country is going to want to seize as much of that profit as it can in order to seize as much tax revenue as it can. But how should we decide who gets what, right? You need some kind of coordination to divide up the pie, but how are we going to do it? Conceptually, I would suggest to you there's a pretty straightforward way we might think about doing that. And it sort of has three steps. First, we would look at that global multinational as a whole, and we would ask, how much profit is it making globally? Once we'd done that, we'd come up with some kind of a formula that could be used to divide up those profits across country in proportion to the level of economic activity happening in individual countries. Right? If there's more economic activity in country A, they get more of the tax revenue. If there's less activity in country B, they get less of the tax revenue. We'd have to agree on what it means to measure economic activity, but generally speaking, we might rely on a formula that says something about assets in a country, sales in a country, and levels of employment in a country within that firm. Now, of course, we would need some kind of a global institution to coordinate all of that. And so the third step in this process might be the creation of some kind of multilateral tax organization to coordinate that formula, resolve conflicts, and evolve over time. This might sound straightforward, or it might sound far-fetched, but we're saying this is what the United States does, more or less, to divide up tax revenues within the United States. It's what the European Union is increasingly moving towards, so it's a pretty sensible way of doing things. The trouble is, that's not actually how our international tax system works, because in, in the 1920s, when the initial rules for this system were created, they moved in a quite different direction, and it's useful to contrast them, I think, with what I've just described. Rather than seeing MNCs as unified global economic actors, they decided that MNCs should be treated as a series of independent economic entities doing business with one another, right? So the two subsidiaries of General Electric are not part of the same company. They're two separate companies that are trading with each other for tax purposes. Once we make that first choice, we then have to decide how are we going to allocate profits between those two subsidiaries of this company? And to do it, what we're going to need to do is price the transactions between them in order to decide who's made more money and who's made less. 
And we'll do that using something called the arm's length principle, which is the real foundation of international tax rules. And the arm's length principle says, transactions between subsidiaries of a multinational should be priced as though they were undertaken between two truly independent economic actors, right? Basically, we're looking for the market price that would exist if two firms engaged in that transaction but weren't connected to each other. But the market-based solution for allocating profits between the subsidiaries of a multinational for tax purpose. And key to this strategy is you allocate profit across subsidiaries based on the value added that they produce, right? So when we think about value added, right, high value added activities like intellectual property, design, marketing, expertise, they create a lot of economic value in the market sense of the word. So they get a lot of the profit for tax purposes. Low value added activities like manufacturing have low profit margins, so they get less of the profit for tax purposes. Right? And then finally, because this is all happening with companies treated as independent entities, we don't really need that multinational ta multilateral tax organization. So instead we rely on bilateral treaties between individual countries to manage their tax affairs and any tax conflicts. So this is the system that we have in practice, quite different from that abstract system I described to begin with. And I draw that contrast in order to highlight what then doesn't work very well about the system that we actually have in practice. And it doesn't work very well in two broad types of ways. The first is, if you're someone who studies international development like me, it tends to disadvantage lower income countries because it focuses on dividing profits based on value added rather than the extent of economic activity. And right? if you divide things based on value added, you give most of the value, most of the profit, and most of the tax revenue to the high value added activities, and those tend to happen in OECD countries. If you focus on economic activity, you would tend to allocate more profit and therefore more tax revenue to the places where lots of things happen, right? Manufacturing activities that tend to occur in lower income countries, right? So in some sense, this formula implicitly, intentionally or not, is biased against lower income countries that tend to host the subsidiaries of multinationals. But there's also a second and broader problem, and that's about the implementation of these rules, right? The arm's length principle sounds nice in practice, a nice, tidy, market-based solution for deciding where profits happen. The trouble is it's very difficult to arrive at an arm's length price, right? I want you to imagine now you have two subsidiaries of the same multinational company, one in China, one in Vietnam, and the Chinese subsidiary is selling microchips to the subsidiary in Vietnam. What is that microchip worth? Is it worth $7, $8, $9, $10? It's hard to know, right? Because every microchip is unique, every transaction is unique, every country is unique in the way these things are priced. The arm's length principle tells us, go out and find two independent firms who engage in the same transaction using the same microchips, find the price they charge, and use that price to price the transaction within the multinational. But in most cases, you can't do it because that transaction doesn't exist. So you have to guess, you have to estimate. And to some extent, you can do that, right? You might be able to figure out, well, the appropriate price of that microchip is somewhere between seven and $10, but we're not sure exactly what the right price is. But that gives a lot of leeway for the multinational corporation to decide exactly what price point to set. And given that leeway, what will they do? Every time, they will price it in a way that moves as much profit as possible into the country with lower taxes and as much profit out of the country with higher taxes. Right? And so that pricing exercise is known as transfer mispricing, and it results in profit shifting, which is exactly what it sounds like, right? the shifting of profits from one country to another. We might not worry that much about that if it's between China and Vietnam, they both charge taxes. But what about now if we stick the British Virgin Islands in the middle, right? So now China sells it microchips to the British Virgin Islands for $7, which in turn sells those microchips to Vietnam for $10. China doesn't get much profit because they sold the microchips cheap. And Vietnam doesn't get much profit because they bought the microchips expensive. All the profit ends up in the British Virgin Islands who just ended up as a conduit between one and the other. Now you might rightly say, surely the world isn't quite that stupid, right? Surely tax authorities can stop that from happening. And you'd be right, right? In most cases, it's more complicated than that. But the logic is exactly that. But how does it get more complicated? 
Well, you could set up more complicated corporate structures to disguise these transactions. The margins on those prices might be smaller. But in many cases, what it really comes down to is the use of what are called intangibles, right? The things that you buy and sell, but you can't quite put a finger on. Intellectual property, patents, design, expertise, consultancy, right? Imagine our case again. China sells those microchips to the British Virgin Islands for $7, and they get on sold to Vietnam for $10. And the argument is that in the meantime, the British Virgin Islands played a critical role in managing the logistics of that operation. And that's why they get all that profit, right? It's the intangible asset. Alternatively, maybe China sells directly to Vietnam, but it's paying royalties to the British Virgin Islands for the use of the patents and expertise of the multinational company which are housed in the British Virgin Islands where they don't get taxed. Right? And so the more complicated the structures get, the more intangible the assets that we're buying and selling, the harder it is to price, the easier it is to move profits around the world, minimizing what you have to pay at home and abroad because you're shifting all the profit into low tax jurisdictions. So that's broadly how it works. And I put a few diagrams up here just to give you some real world examples of what that looks like, but I'll deal with them really quickly just to give you a flavor. This is a diagram, again, in very simplified form of how Google set up its tax operations for a long time, right? So Google sells mostly advertising. Advertising can be sold from anywhere. So Google set up its advertising wing in Ireland because Ireland has low taxes. So any ad that Google sold, the revenue from that accrued to this Irish subsidiary where taxes would be low. Google also sent most of its patents and intellectual property to a holding company in Bermuda where there are no corporate taxes. And so two things happened then. Whenever they sold ads, the revenue went to Ireland with low taxes. At the same time, Ireland was paying royalties back to the Bermudan holding company for the use of Google's, of Google's intellectual property. The end result, Google's paying low rates of tax in Ireland, and it's paying no rate of tax in Bermuda, where a lot of the profit is ending up, right? In aggregate, Google was paying something between three and 5% more or less of profits in taxes compared to statutory rates of 25 to 35% in most countries. So that's one example. We can see something very similar, which was written up a few years ago, I think in The Guardian, related to Del Monte bananas. Now, it is the same kind of thing. Bananas are produced in Central America, and the head office is in the United States. But the head office transfers intellectual property, expertise, logistics, transport, brand names, all of that stuff, into the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, and Bermuda, where there are no corporate taxes. And so every time bananas are produced in Central America, they're paying royalties to those tax haven countries for the use of brands, transport, and so on. In that way, profits leave Central America where the bananas are produced and end up in those islands where nothing's really happening, but that's where all the profit is accruing. So no profits are paid, no taxes are paid in Central America, no taxes are paid or few taxes are paid in the United States but lots of profit ends up overseas and stays with the company. Here's a third example, just slightly different. Here's a copper mine in Zambia producing copper. It's selling its copper to Glencore International, which is sitting up there in Switzerland, right? That subsidiary of Glencore in Switzerland is in turn owned by Glencore held in Bermuda. Why? Because in this jurisdiction in Switzerland, if you're a foreign owned company, you pay less taxes, right? So that's the first move. But the second move is the Zambian copper mine is selling copper to Glencore in Switzerland for a very low price. So this copper mine is not making any money because it's selling its copper so cheap. But why would they sell their copper so cheap? Well, the answer is that they're owned by this investment house in the British Virgin Islands. But that investment house is in turn owned by Glencore. So effectively, they're selling copper to themselves at a low price in order to get profits out of high tax Zambia and into low tax Switzerland. But in order to disguise what they're doing, they're working through this investment house that disguises the fact that this firm is related to Glencore so that the government doesn't catch on and can't tax them effectively, right? And these are simple examples. All of these examples are more complicated than I've just made them out to be, but hopefully it gives you a sense of how all of this works. So that's how it works for multinational companies. How does this work when we think about high net worth individuals trying to move their wealth abroad to avoid taxes? So the broad logic here is very, very straightforward, right? I, as a wealthy person sitting here in Toronto, want to somehow get the money that I have 
out of the country into an offshore jurisdiction and make sure that that money can't be traced back to me. And right? so somehow I have to make it anonymous where it is overseas. So how might I go about doing that? Well, in some simple form, I'd probably get on the phone and I'd call down to the US state of Delaware, which it turns out is possibly the easiest place in the world to do this, at least as of a few years ago. And I'd set up an anonymous shell company. It could be called WP Investments. Right? That's my new shell company. And critically, it's going to be anonymous because I'm going to nominate directors for that company, basically people who will be directors for a fee, so that it can't be traced back to me, but they'll still do what they say with the money. Right? So I control the money, but it can't be traced back to me. Once that structure is set up, my new anonymous shell company could set up a bank account in Switzerland, an investment account in Luxembourg, or all kinds of other things through which the money that I get offshore will then make income overseas, which can't be linked back to me and therefore can't be taxed here in Canada. And there are a host of ways I might get the money from here in Canada into those offshore accounts via that anonymous shell company, right? I might just make a whole series of small bank transfers so no one's alerted to them. I might carry a suitcase full of cash. Or I might set up all kinds of fraudulent kinds of financial transactions that'll move money offshore under the guise of being a serious economic transaction, but which is really just designed to get the money out of my account. Right? There are a host of ways to do it, but the logic is simple, right? Get the money from me into this anonymous company, into anonymous accounts that can't be traced back. In principle, this shouldn't be possible. Most jurisdictions in the world have things called know your customer regulations, right? If you open a bank account for someone, you need to know who the beneficial owner is. That is, who is the person who really owns and controls that money, not just the name on the account. The trouble is those rules are very easy to evade. Lots of studies have shown that quite conclusively. And as I mentioned earlier, they're often particularly easy to evade right next door in the United States. And finally, when we think about how this all works, it's worth thinking about the role of facilitators, right? Most individuals don't have the expertise to go out and set up shell corporations and complex uh, financial structures all over the world. Instead, they turn to tax lawyers and tax accountants to help them do it. Firms are the same, right? Firms are always turning to their tax departments or large tax and accountancy firms to help them come up with ever more complex ways of moving wealth and profits around the world in order to minimize their tax burdens, right? General Electric famously had a tax department, now outsourced, interestingly, uh, of almost a thousand people, right? A thousand people. And it was said that half of everyone's job was to find new ways to reduce General Electric's tax burden through these complex kinds of tax structures to move profits around the world, right? And there are a host of examples that are the same. In some ways, the firms that facilitate these structures have come increasingly under scrutiny. Right? If you think about something like the Panama Papers leak, which revealed all kinds of these structures through a firm in Panama, that was one example of the firms that do this and they've come under attack. Even some of the big accounting firms like PwC, Ernst & Young, periodically they'll get fined for pushing a bit too far in setting up these structures, going over the line from legal, but maybe not very moral, into illegality. Right? But overall, the penalties have tended to be outweighed by the benefits, and these structures have continued to flourish. As importantly, these facilitators are important because they tend to be a lobby in favor of the status quo. Right? If you're a big tax accountancy firm, you benefit from complex global rules because you have then a role in navigating them. And so when it comes to reform, there's a suspicion that these guys are very important within those international consultations in pushing for the kinds of complexity that gives rise to the kinds of problems that I've described. So where then are we now? Right? Hopefully now you have a handle on how this system functions or doesn't function uh, and where the various problems lie. But it's not that the world is blind to these problems. And in fact, the last five or six years have seen quite ambitious efforts at reform. The most ambitious efforts, at least in a generation, to reform these rules and try to begin to solve some of these problems. Um, but the big question about those reform efforts ultimately is, have they actually done enough to make a difference or are they just shifting outcomes at the margin? And so again, in talking about those reform process, I'm gonna talk now in reverse, first about high net worth individuals, the reforms trying to target them, and then about efforts to tax multinationals more effectively. And when we think about taxing high net worth individuals, the key reform post-financial crisis has been a global push for the implementation of something called automatic exchange of information for tax purposes. 
And that is exactly what it sounds like. It is a set of regulations that would call on all tax administrations to share data with their counterpart tax administrations automatically about any citizens from foreign countries who held wealth and therefore earned income within their country, right? So if I'm a Canadian citizen with a bank account in Switzerland, the Swiss tax authorities will see that a Canadian owns that bank account, that it made income, and they will report that back automatically to the Canadian tax authorities so that I can be taxed. In principle, if you get all countries signed on to that and they share that data faithfully, that closes almost all of the loopholes I've just described for avoiding taxes by wealthy individuals. Because no matter where you hide your money, it's going to get reported back to your national home jurisdiction anyway. The question is, is it going to work? And of course, we don't know the answer yet because this is new. But there are three big questions that probably need to be answered. Right? The first is, will all jurisdictions actually participate? Right? Will everyone share data? The second is, will beneficial ownership be available? Right? So we talked about beneficial ownership a minute ago. This only works if the financial institution in Switzerland knows who actually owns that bank account so that you can report it back to the Canadian government. But if I've disguised that ownership information, the information never gets back home. And third, will developing countries be able to participate in this process effectively? So let's look at all three in turn, where in all cases, somewhat unfortunately, the returns so far are at least grounds for some skepticism about how big the impact will be. Um, though that's not to say that we should give up on these efforts. With respect to participation, most major jurisdictions have signed up to these rules and are ready to participate. That in and of itself is a quite remarkable outcome relative to what was expected a decade ago. It is a um, quite remarkable level of global cooperation. The trouble is there are still holdouts. And one of the big holdouts so far is the United States. And if the United States fails to participate, the risk is twofold. One that undermines enthusiasm for broader participation, particularly from other tax havens. But second, that as long as there's one big holdout, a lot of that offshore money might go directly to the United States where it won't be reported elsewhere. Right? We don't yet know what's going to happen, but there's one grounds for real concern. And that is that the United States, because it is so economically powerful, has already passed laws that force all other countries to share data with it without it sharing any data in return. Right? So most countries have signed up for AEOI because they said, we'll share data in order to get data. The U.S. says, we're already getting the data. Do we necessarily need to share our data back? Right? And so time will tell, but that's an obvious source of concern. A second source of concern relates to beneficial ownership rules. Will we actually be able to know who owns the wealth overseas, or will it be shouted in secrecy behind uh, anonymous shell corporations of various kinds? And there again, the information so far is imperfect. The G20 has again made a serious push to have countries around the world, and specifically its members, put in place new registries of beneficial owners in order to make this more transparent, at least for tax administrations to access. The trouble is about whether that will work. The G20 has actually called for those beneficial registries to be made publicly available so anyone could see who owns these corporate structures. But so far, very few countries have actually gone down that road. A larger number of countries have said, we will set up beneficial ownership registries, but private, only accessible to law enforcement and tax administrations. Still not bad. The question is whether it's going to work. Right? Gathering that data is hard. It costs money. It takes real serious effort by national authorities. And it remains to be seen whether they'll be successful in putting together really high quality and complete data, particularly given how quickly those who are trying to avoid those regulations can go about setting up new structures, new structures, and new structures to avoid the reach of tax administrations. And again, we have a problem of compliance. Right? As I said earlier, probably the easiest place in the world to register an anonymous shell company is the United States. And it's not yet clear whether the United States will take measures to solve that problem, particularly because, much like in Canada, this is a question of states' rights. It's not just federal legislation. Right? And the states who profit from doing this aren't in any hurry to change the way that they do business. Finally, when it comes to low-income countries, again, the news is not great. While low-income countries have begun to sign up, to a certain extent, most low-income countries have not yet signed up. And even for those who have signed up, it's not clear that they'll actually be able to access relevant data. Right? Wealthier countries have, in brief, said, 
We can't share data with you unless you have systems in place to ensure data security once it arrives with you. That's not in principle an unreasonable thing to say. The trouble is, it's becoming increasingly clear that low-income countries are gonna struggle enormously to put those kinds of systems in place. And if they can't, they won't get access to any of the data. So we'll circle back to that problem a little later. So what about in relation to multinational companies? What reform has been tried and how far have we gotten? So here again, there has been a huge reform program over the past six years. Launched in 2012, it was the, called the Project for Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, led by the OECD, supported by the G20. Recommendations emerged in 2015 after global consultations, and since then, implementation has begun to move forward. Again, in many respects, we can think of this as a remarkable success. Right? After almost a century without global cooperation on tax issues, we have an agreement that has had broad global buy-in and acceptance. The reforms that have been adopted went much further than what people were predicting seven or eight years ago. That said, there remains significant skepticism about whether the reforms undertaken have fundamentally reshaped the basic problems with the system as it exists today. And again, this isn't a fringe view. This is something coming directly out of the IMF, which has already raised questions about what further reform will necessarily look like. Right? And so there's a question, has this been a success that will change outcomes, or has this been a political success for the OECD in getting broad global buy-in without fundamentally changing what's going to be happening on the ground? So just quickly about some of the big notable successes of this process, because I think they are worth acknowledging in the spirit of global cooperation. Probably the most interesting from my perspective is the introduction of something called country-by-country -country reporting. That says that for the first time, and in some ways it's remarkable that this didn't exist before, all multinational companies must report to tax administrations on a country-by-country -country basis how much revenue and profit they earn and how much tax they pay. The idea is that if a company is booking all of its profits and all of its profits in a tax haven country, tax authorities can now see that. They can see that that is abnormal, and they can try to figure out what's wrong and then try to enforce taxes more effectively. Right? This is an important breakthrough. And insofar as countries have access to that information, it will help them try to enforce the rules while revealing the most obvious cases of abuse. We've also seen new measures to reform tax treaties, to reduce the scope for abuses that have been put into many tax treaties around the world. There are new measures that have been put in place to assist countries in combating various forms of transfer mispricing. New rules on permanent establishment. Right? Countries, companies like Amazon, Right? They don't have economic operations in every country. Right? They have a head office where business happens, and they have warehouses in the countries where they deliver goods. For a long time, they've said, we don't therefore have to pay taxes in the place where the goods are delivered because we don't have a full permanent establishment there. New rules are trying to change that to make sure that digital companies have to pay in the places where they operate. And likewise, there's broader work going on to figure out how to more effectively tax the digital economy, among others. Right? These are really important steps in many respects. But the most problematic foundation of the existing system remains in place and fundamentally unchanged. Right? The arm's length principle says we need to be able to price those transactions within multinational groups in order to allocate profits. And while the measures that have been put in place here help to sort of close that gap a little bit, the basic problem remains that you don't have a really good, convincing, compelling way to price those transactions. And that's particularly true for low-income countries who have less comparable transactions drawn and much lower administrative capacity to try to enforce those rules. And in many ways, tax professionals will tell you that the negotiation of these transfer pricing arrangements ends up looking like just that, a negotiation. Right? This isn't a technical scientific accounting process. This is multinational firms and tax authorities coming together and arguing about what the appropriate transfer price is, and eventually they reach agreement, which dictates where tax is allocated and how much tax is paid. The new measures might shift that negotiation a little bit in favor of national tax authorities, but there's a risk that it doesn't change the broader reality of what's happened. Meanwhile, in the background lacks the continuing problem of tax competition. What do I mean by that? Around the world, corporate tax rates have gone down and down and down over time. Because when one country cuts its corporate tax rates, other countries tend to follow suit in the competition to attract foreign direct investments. There's nothing about the current reform program that has tried to address or reduce the broad pressure for that to continue to happen. 
And the limitations of reform in some ways are reflected in the recent tax reform that's occurred in the United States. And it's not the stuff that's gotten all the headlines, but it's really important when we think about international tax rules. The United States imposed a new foreign profits tax, which says if you are a foreign company, or if you are a company earning foreign profits, and you don't pay much profit overseas, we're gonna tax you at home at a fixed lower rate, but we are gonna tax you. And likewise, it's a special tax on intellectual property. If you developed intellectual property in the United States, we are going to tax the proceeds of that intellectual property, irrespective of where nominally it resides. In both ways, what the United States has said in effect is, we're not convinced the arm's length principle is gonna work in allocating profits and ensuring that our multinationals pay enough tax in the United States. And so we're gonna adopt unilateral measures to try to do better. The UK, in fact, has done something somewhat similar in trying to tax firms like Amazon and Google, introducing a unilateral, slightly different, unique tax to ensure that they are taxed when they don't declare enough profit otherwise. That's an indication of the extent to which these other reforms might not be working well enough, but it's not clear that smaller countries can take advantage of the same kinds of strategies so easily. The other evidence, or sorry, the, the other way to look at this is the extent to which it works for low-income countries. And again, the story is for low-income countries, the problems are that much larger than they are for OECD countries. And there are a host of reasons why that might be true. With respect to the arm's length principle, it doesn't work well in the OECD, but tax administrations themselves are very sophisticated in trying to make it work. It is near impossible to implement in low-income countries. Tax administrative capacity is more limited, and the list of comparables to draw on is more limited as well. Similarly, a lot of the technical remedies that came up in the BEPS process don't really matter much to low-income countries because they're simply too complicated to administer in practice. Access to data under country-by-country -country reporting is also unclear, much like data from automatic exchange of information. Right? That data has to arrive from the home countries of those multinational firms, it's not yet clear whether that data in fact will be shared, because that's gonna depend on the extent of data safeguards and whether richer countries are willing to share the data. They might not, right? And finally, one of the core problems of the international tax system from the perspective of low-income countries is unchanged, right? Profit allocation for tax purposes is based on value added rather than the extent of economic activities. And so most profit continues to flow to OECD countries where the high value added activities occur. But developing country dissatisfaction with those outcomes is reflected in the extent to which some of the larger developing countries have pushed back and in, a whole, in various different kinds of ways. Brazil has effectively said these rules are too complicated, we can't implement them. And so they continue to implement simplified approaches to managing transfer pricing, which are contradictory to OECD rules, but they've done it anyway because they say, for us, this works better. China has said, we're unsatisfied with the tax revenues that accrue to us based on the allocation of profit in proportion to value added, right? Because lots of the activities happening in China are manufacturing, low value added. So China has put in place a new set of rules unique to China, which in effect allow China to claim, we deserve a bigger piece of the tax pie owing to the critical activities that occur within our country, even if they're low value added, right? And so they're pulling more of the tax pie towards themselves. India has continued to worry about representation and has pushed for a greater role of the UN within tax rule negotiations in order to strengthen developing country voices. While African states have just recently begun to ask questions about whether this whole process really means much for them or whether they might just be wasting their time, right? We'll see where that leads, but I think it is a reflection of the extent to which there is nervousness in low-income countries about whether these rules will actually mean much in improving outcomes. So what then, given all of those concerns, can be done? Within OECD countries, I think the headline message remains, as a first step, implement the rules that have been passed. Right? For all its failures, these are real, meaningful reforms, at least up to a point. And getting them implemented would make a difference, at least for middle and higher income countries. Right? But there are barriers to implementation across a whole host of areas with the United States looming large. There are also particular challenges, I think, related to beneficial ownership information. Right? That's probably the hardest technical task, task is gathering all of that beneficial ownership information to make it possible to tax various entities more effectively. 
And just to give you a sense of how hard this is, Canada historically, again, since we're sitting here in Canada, has been a major laggard. It has been very easy to register anonymous companies in Canada, which is then very useful for avoiding taxes. Just in December, the Canadian government has finally signaled they will try to remedy that, but doing so requires cooperation with the provinces, and the goal for now is that that might happen by the middle of 2019. We'll wait and see, but the hope is that that will move forward, but it's indicative of the nature of the challenge. Worse still is while there are good beneficial ownership rules increasingly in the financial sector, there are almost none in relation to the real estate sector. And so as you may have picked up in debates about real estate in Toronto and Vancouver, there are big concerns, not just about foreign money buying real estate, but real estate purchased using anonymous shell corporations. But those can be useful for money laundering, corruption, tax avoidance, and, all, and a whole host of other things. Because while the bank needs to know your identity to set up a bank account, a realtor does not need to know your identity to sell you a property. Right? And that remains a major loophole in many of these rules. Um, so those are short-term pushes to implement existing rules, but in the longer term, there are two things that I at least find interesting to think about. One is simply monitoring the impacts of the rules that have been passed systematically, right? Are they actually working or not? That's the kind of information that will then guide what comes next. Ideally, that would be accompanied by expanded transparency, which would ensure that it's not just governments themselves, but also civil society organizations, researchers and the like, who can contribute to that process of monitoring what's happened and whether these rules are working. In the longer term, I also personally, and this is a very personal view, I'm interested in approaches to simplifying and democratization, the making of, democratizing the making of these global rules. One of the sort of critical features of global tax rules is they are incredibly complicated in their details, even if intuitively at a broad level, they're accessible. What that means is it's very hard for developing countries, let alone average citizens, to engage in those debates. It makes them hard to change. It makes them hard to implement. Over time, I wouldn't be shocked if developing countries in particular begin to call more and more for simplification as part of the process for democratizing participation in making those rules. But what about low-income countries? Right? There, the problem is that much more complicated for all the reasons I've already described. And in my mind, low-income countries probably have three kinds of options that they could pursue moving forward. The first is basically keep trying to implement the international rules that have been arrived at, despite the risk that they'll be very costly with limited benefits. As I say, my gut tells me that tide is beginning to turn. They're beginning to question whether this is going to pay off, and they might begin pulling back from the large investments they've made in implementing OECD rules. But time will tell. If they don't go that route, what else might they do? One possibility is that developing countries will pull away from the BEPS process and push more aggressively for deeper reform of international rules to create rules that are more beneficial for lower income countries as well. The other option is they'll do the best with the rules they already have, capture the low hanging fruit, so to speak, but otherwise essentially give up on the international process and try to adopt domestic strategies for achieving some of the same goals without relying on an international process that may not, in the near term, work well for them. <clears throat> so what might those things look like? If developing countries were to push for deeper reform of international tax rules, there's a few things we might expect to see. One is they would certainly push for more effective transparency around beneficial ownership rules. Right? That depends on the work of richer countries to collect that data and share it widely. That would be critical uh, for developing countries to benefit. Second, they're likely to push for major improvements in their ability to access data through things like automatic exchange of information and country by country reporting. It's obviously entirely legitimate for wealthier countries to be worried about data security when they're sharing taxpayer data globally. On the other hand, those standards can be set so high as to intentionally or unintentionally preclude lower income countries from participating actively. There might be a better balance to be struck, such that you don't hand over tax data, for example, to a regime that's known to go after its taxpayers in the political opposition, but you do hand over tax data to countries who may simply lack the capacity to put in place good safeguards, but are otherwise trying to use that data for national development. There's likely to be, as I've suggested, I think, a bigger push for simplification of existing rules, or at least the adoption of simplified methods for enforcing these rules within lower income countries. Brazil is the obvious model, though interestingly, 
the OECD is in the process of trying to put pressure on Brazil to abandon those very same rules as we speak. Fourth, we might see more countries try to do a bit more of what China's tried to do. To say more profit should be allocated to source countries where a lot of economic activity takes place, even if those activities are low value added. And you could think of various forms in which they might pursue that kind of agenda. But again, that remains very much at the fringe of current reform discussions, because it is a more sort of fundamental critique of the logic of the international tax system. And finally, you could imagine a push for greater representation in the setting of global rules, in part to achieve these other kinds of objectives. But those are all very ambitious goals, right? Those are politically difficult. And this comes to the political question I raised at the beginning. It's not obvious that wealthy countries are going to buy into the kinds of things that low-income countries most want, right? It's hard to get the United States to implement the rules right now, let alone a set of rules that go further in trying to benefit the, the countries in which U.S. multinationals do business. So what happens if for low-income countries in the near term, reform of international rules that really works for them isn't realistic? Right? My suggestion would be you then look domestically for other ways of taxing the constituencies that you're not able to tax because of current international tax rules. And there are ways of doing that, right? Of not relying on the international process, but trying to figure out what else you can do. At some broad level, you might simply target what I've called the dangling fruit here, but that is the big untapped tax bases that exist at home, right? Part of the reason big multinationals and wealthy individuals don't pay taxes in low-income countries is because of international tax rules. But the other reason is they're politically connected, and so they're protected from paying the taxes that they really do owe, right? And so one place to start would be forget the international process but let's just try to tax those groups better using the resources that are already at hand. The second would be to do what Brazil has done, implement simplified rules for enforcing international tax rules unilaterally, right? Acknowledge we are violating OECD guidelines, but that's life because that's the only thing that works for us. Let's see what happens, right? That going to the bottom of this list would be much easier to do working regionally, right? It's one thing for Ghana on its own to say, we're implementing these measures. It's much easier to do if all the countries in West Africa do the same, right? And so regional action becomes a possibility. The same is true for alternative strategies for corporate taxation at home. One proposal that's out there is alternative minimum taxes. What does an alternative minimum tax do? You might know this from US debates about the alternative minimum tax. It says effectively, if you're a corporation and the profits that you declare for tax purposes are abnormally low, we will ignore your declaration, take a standard share of revenue, and tax you on that instead, right? Simple as that. Lots of countries have these laws on the books. Some of them use them. And increasingly, there is evidence that they're not very distorting of economic activity, but they raise much more revenue and they do so more equitably. There's space for more research, but it's another place countries might look that don't rely on the international system. Uh, and finally, you might think about other strategies for taxing individual wealth. Right? You can't tax those foreign bank accounts, but you can tax property that's held domestically. You can tax luxury goods and luxury profits, or luxury goods uh, and luxury items. You can put more withholding taxes on money flowing out of the country. Right? One way that people move money out of the country is to have salaries, for example, paid to offshore bank accounts. Well, tax that. Right? The money's going out. You don't know where it's going. It hasn't been taxed. Withhold taxes against future taxes on income. If future taxes on income are not paid, at least you collected some taxes at the initial point of contact. So those are a host of things that one could do, but the idea underlying all of this is if you're a low-income country, obviously you want an international process that works. But we also know that those international processes often don't work for the poorest countries, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to plead helplessness. There might be other ways in which countries can try to take control of their own dynamics in trying to improve outcomes. So where does that leave us? What comes next? Uh, this has been a very long talk. I hope you're all still with me uh, so far. Um, but I think the basic point I want to make is international tax rules, international tax debates are often obscure. They're hidden from public view. That's begun to change with things like the Panama Papers leak. But still, this is not something we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis as a major issue of global justice. But it should be because it has huge implications for national and global development, for inequality, for crime, and so forth. Um, 
It's also an issue that has very much been characterized by global power politics, right? The rules that exist were made by OECD countries. They have been enforced by OECD countries. And even recent reform, as far as it has gone, has continued to reflect the interests of the most powerful countries, right? That raises important questions for developing countries and for lower income countries in particular. And finally, there's a question, right? As this hidden issue increasingly comes into the public eye, what then comes next? Is there the potential for public pressure and various kinds of engagement to continue to tilt the balance towards more progressive rules that work better and curbing the types of tax abuse that we've seen? One of the amazing things of, the, of recent years has been the growth of advocacy around tax issues in favor of more taxation, a thing that, as Meta suggested at the beginning, you never would have imagined would have happened a decade ago. Right? And as that grows, we've sort of seen the power of public engagement to push for change. Uh, and so in some ways, the question going forward is, will that continue and how far can it shift the dynamics that I've described here today? Uh, so thank you very, very much for all of your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Meta, how do I handle questions here? No, you're going to point, you're going to put your own questions. I don't need to do it. I'm sure you can point at people who put their hands up. Let me start one. Okay. Uh, what difference uh, will blockchain make? Any? Ah, the big question, uh, the big hot question. My own personal opinion uh, on blockchain, I can only speak from the perspective of low-income countries, I suppose. That's the first thing to say. Uh, my sense is that low-income countries, but possibly for all of these countries, it probably won't matter that much. Uh, and the reason I say that is I think, you know, there's a, there's a temptation to think that technology will solve all of our problems, that new technology will make all of this more transparent. But I think transparency will, or technology will only make it all more transparent if the various particip participants in the process want to make it more transparent, right? Uh, one of the applications that people suggest for blockchain technology is property registration. Uh, you can use it for property registration. It makes it much easier then to transfer property from one person to the next. It's a nice idea. And insofar as everyone wants property registration to be transparent, that could work. But what happens in environments in, people, in which people don't want property to be transparently registered? What happens when people want it to be disguised? My understanding of sort of the pilot studies in this area suggests it's not that easy to, it's not that difficult to subvert the system. And in places where people don't want transparency, the things don't get onto the blockchain in the first place, right? And so at least in low-income countries, the problems are already about how do you get even the systems that exist today to work? Whereas to me, blockchain is about how do you get current systems that are working reasonably well to work even better, right? So it's sort of, that's often the future to me. Whereas I think a lot of the questions I'm describing here are much more foundational. And unless you get those systems fixed, the technology can't do that much for you. I'd love to be proven wrong, uh, but that's, that's my sense. You know, I'm, not, I'm maybe not a believer in the technological fix. Yes. Yeah, just a little puzzle. Um, <clears throat> in the case of individuals, you have described them as wanting to get money out of the country. Uh, so it would be subject to less or no taxes at all. And presumably that's what the objectives of corporations are. But isn't it also the case that those people and those corporations want to use that money or benefit from the existence of that money? How do they do that? How do they get to use that money? And how do they get to use it to buy a bigger television in the house or in the country where they live? Okay, so a very good question. Uh, and let me, let me do my best. Uh, I'm not an expert. I don't do this myself. Um, but uh, let me start with corporations and what this sort of looks like. Uh, so let me take a case like Apple or Google, right? They're two big high profile companies. Uh, 200 billion offshore right now. Exactly. So what does Apple do, right? They avoid all these global taxes, but in order to avoid those taxes, they have to keep all the money offshore. They can't bring it back to the United States. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't use it. It just means it can't use it within the United States, right? And so, the, so Apple, for example, has used all that money it's had offshore for example, to buy other companies also held offshore, right? So the whole transaction happens outside of the United States. It can do that easily enough, right? Um, in the same spirit, uh, it can reinvest in its subsidiaries overseas without paying taxes because then that money never has to come back into the United States because all of it's happening offshore, right? And so the whole host of things you can do with that money offshore. Um, that said, I mean, taking the Apple example again, they do want to bring the money home, right? There is a sense now with the US tax reform uh, there's now a more attractive tax regime for bringing the money home. And at least some of that money, it looks like, will in fact come back into the United States. Um, it's possible that's in part some, a political decision, right, to, 
to sort of clean the money, so to speak. Uh, but one suspects it's also a practical decision that the money is that much more useful to them if they can also use it in the United States, right? So there are limits uh, to having your money offshore. Some of it you need at home to use it. Uh, but there are lots of things you can do with money when it's held offshore. Um, I mean, perhaps the other thing to say about this is I think for a lot of people with money held offshore, one of the bets they're making is if we keep it offshore long enough, eventually the government will come to us and allow us to bring it home on good terms. Right? So if you're Apple and you were keeping all that money offshore, it seems not unlikely that in the back of their mind, Apple thought to themselves, if we keep that money offshore long enough, eventually someone will come around, Donald Trump or someone else, who will want us to bring that money back into the United States and will offer us a favorable corporate tax rate to do so. Right? So they've still saved themselves a huge amount of money by keeping it offshore and waiting for that favorable moment. Right? The, the Indonesian uh, tax exemption or tax amnesty program is the same for individuals, right? Keep my money offshore, keep it offshore, make all this money, don't pay taxes, because one day the government is gonna offer an amnesty program which will allow me to bring that money home for free without having to pay taxes. And I just have to bide my time. Uh, and that's been true in a lot of countries for a very long time that periodically you get amnesty programs which allows people to bring money home. Um, but again, going to individuals, there's a lot of things you can do as an individual with the money that's parked offshore without ever bringing it home. Uh, so I mean, for example, maybe you've got all this money offshore and you want to buy a private plane or you want to buy a yacht. Well, you just do it offshore, right? So you now have a yacht that is owned by this anonymous shell company, but which you use, right? You might rent the yacht from that anonymous shell company, but both of them are you, right? Uh, so you're still able to use the money. You just can't sort of identify it as your own. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thing you see. Likewise, if you have money offshore, you could buy foreign properties. And in fact, in the big housing markets around the world, London, New York, et cetera, huge shares of the luxury, pro luxury properties in those cities are owned through anonymous shell companies. Right? So there's every reason to believe that that's in fact a very good example of places where money are using offshore money to buy other stuff offshore, which they can then enjoy when they themselves move offshore. Um, so again, sometimes they'll want to bring some money home because they want a new TV. But a lot of the big ticket items you might use that kind of money for uh, are things you can buy without actually having to bring the money home. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Yeah, excellent. Uh, other questions? Okay. Uh, let's, uh, well, sure. Let's go left to right. Go for it. Yes. My left. Sorry. Uh, I mean, I suspect there will be, is, is my, sh my short view of this. I think, you know, the, you know, leaks have continued to happen, you know, year after year for the past five or six years. Uh, in fact, there was another leak more recently, didn't get quite the same profile as the Panama Papers, but not dissimilar in its broad content, um, the name of which actually escapes me just now, the sort of popular name. Um, so it keeps happening. And uh, sorry? Paradise Papers. Paradise Papers. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, anyone suspects this will continue. I think the big question you know, for someone like me who studies these issues or activists who work on these issues is to what extent will continue leaks continue to generate more and more pressure for things to actually change? Uh, and it's not entirely clear what the answer to that question is. I think with every leak, there's a little bit more pressure. I think they do help to catalyze public attention to these issues. Um, on the other hand, maybe you get sort of leak fatigue. At some point, everyone knows this is out there, it's happening, we've seen it, but, you know, but nothing's changing. Um, but again, you know, for me as an academic, certainly for activists, I think you sort of seize on those moments as a moment uh, in which you try to get change to happen. You try to sort of seize on important cases uh, to move things forward. You know, and it may be that for those who have suffered consequences after those leaks, that then becomes a sort of example for others who might consider doing the same kinds of things, right? Uh, and so again, I think more of that is important. Uh, you know, I think in the wake of some of these leaks, national tax authorities have launched investigative cases against the people named in those leaks. I think it will be instructive to see the extent to which those cases actually lead places, lead to certainly to back taxes, potentially even to criminal prosecutions, right? If you start to see strong consequences for being named in those leaks, that might then become an important deterrent for people doing more of it, right? Uh, but I think that remains to be seen because we haven't yet seen as far as I know, um, but I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong, uh, a lot of consequences yet because a lot of those cases are still, still in progress. Um, so yeah, to be continued. Uh, question in the middle first, then over to the side. Yeah, that's it. Um, you mentioned the United States being able to um, basically have all these um, all these unilateral deals that benefit them by virtue of sort of their, their economic power. Um, 
with the with the expansion of China around the world, especially in Africa, do you see them pursuing similar sorts of uh, agreements, bilateral agreements? So I think the short answer is yes. Um, but I think it's just starting, and people are probably just now starting to pay attention to it. It's actually, um, it's actually the piece of research I'm working on right now, along with a colleague at the London School of Economics, uh, is uh, is very much about that question. I think what we've been finding in doing that research, so much to our surprise, uh, has been that China does, in fact, seem to be doing things much like the U.S., where it is essentially using its economic power to put in place rules that benefit it in ways that don't benefit other countries in the same way. Um, so I mentioned on an earlier slide uh, this idea of location-specific advantages, right, where China is sort of saying, yes, the activities happening in our country are generally considered low value added, but we deserve more of the tax pie. And what they've actually said more specifically is they've said, there's something unique about manufacturing in China that is particularly valuable because China is uniquely productive. It is uniquely valuable. And so when you look at the general value added of those kinds of activities around the world, it's low. But the value added when it happens in China is larger because China is such a uniquely important and productive market. And for that reason, China therefore should get a bigger cut of the profits because of its uniqueness, right? No other country could do that, potentially because no other country is quite as productive right now as China is. But even if they were, no country is big enough to insist that the rest of the world live by the rules that China is setting unilaterally and which are inconsistent with OECD rules. Um, but the OECD has decided to live with that, right? And that's what's sort of interesting about this. China's big enough that very quietly the whole world has sort of said implicitly, we're gonna let China do that, even if it violates the rules that everyone else plays by, because China's big enough and important enough that we'll have to make compromises to keep them on board. Right, and that's very much the same kind of thing I think historically the U.S. has done and continues to do. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if that continues to happen moving forward. Um, but that's just a guess. Uh, yes? I just wonder whether Karl Marx uh, put this, uh, inadvertently put this into play when he wrote his books and said 60% of the wealth of the country should go to the uh, workers. And then the rich boys played off of that and thought, well, we should uh, develop another castle somewhere so we can hide that loot and not give it to the peasants. I don't know if that's what it is or not. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to sort of parse it as I go. Um, I mean, I think in some ways, when I certainly when I think about international tax rules, I don't know that this is. I'm not unsympathetic to the kind of thing you're describing, but I, but I don't know that this is hiding revenue from the workers so much as it is hiding revenue from national governments. Um, it might have a similar kind of effect, right? That is, insofar as companies don't have to pay as many taxes, you know, a lot of that revenue is then going to shareholders. Shareholders are, by and large, the relatively wealthy, whereas public services, by and large, uh, benefit the poor disproportionately. Uh, in the same way, insofar as these tax rules are transfer money from poor countries to rich countries, the same kind of thing, right? The profits are going to the richer parts of the world and the richer people in them rather than the poorer parts of the world. So I don't think it's a perfect parallel, um, but I think these sort of broad stories of inequity and what that this is reinforcing probably is the same kind of thing, right? So that is, this is very much a story in which the rich gets richer, the poor get poorer um, by virtue of a set of rules that allow the relatively wealthy, the relatively powerful to benefit from the nature of the rules as they exist today, uh, in part by exploiting gray areas in those rules. Right? Because it's the, the sort of bigger companies and wealthier individuals who are best able to exploit uh, those gray areas in the law. Uh, yes. Um, question from the web. Uh, they were asking what the web address is for ICDT, and they were also asking where they could get educated on these topics. Great. Okay. Uh, this is a good time to pitch my research organization. Okay. So the ICTD, which is the International Center for Tax and Development, uh, the website is easy. It's www.ictd.ac. That's it. Um, so where could you educate yourself about those issues? Well, of course, one place to go would be to ictd.ac, um, where, in fact, I think you would find interesting writing about this. I think particularly from the perspective of developing countries, uh, I think it is, in fact, true to say that some of the most interesting research has come out of my center, but certainly not written by me, um, but by written by the people who have taught me about these issues uh, uh, and for which I'm very grateful. 
Um, and I think they've the, the writing that's come through the ICT has been particularly about sort of broad critiques of the international system as it exists and the ways in which it disadvantages developing countries. Um, so that's one very good place to look. Anything um, particularly for Australia, because this person is asking from Australia. Ah, so if you're in Australia and you care about these issues, you should look up an academic named Jason Sharman, um, who is a professor in Australia. I can't think of where he's based. Uh, but he is, for my money, one of the, you know, the very, very best people in the world working on these issues. Um, and I'm sure he would then know a lot about the particulars of the particularities of the Australian case. So again, Jason Sharman, uh, a wonderful, wonderful academic. Uh, other questions? Uh, back there again. Yes. Um, could you explain how individuals spend their money that's offshore without anybody knowing about it? Uh, I did, but I, I can quickly repeat it, which is uh, essentially to say that I think there are a lot of things you can buy offshore without ever bringing your money home. Uh, and a couple of the sort of big things people tend to buy, as far as I understand it, foreign real estate, uh, which you can just buy using the non shell corporation. So no one even knows who's buying the property, uh, let alone bring the money home. Uh, or sort of big ticket items like yachts, private planes, that kind of thing, uh, which are often purchased anyway through anonymous shell corporations. Um, and which as an individual, you could then use it. You might lease it from that shell corporation, but of course the shell corporation is you. So the money is just sort of going around in circles, but keeping the ownership uh, and those broad resources offshore hidden. So you can't just write yourself a check and spend it here? Uh, that would be more difficult. So that is, I, again, I, I'm not engaged in this stuff myself. Um, I've never tried. Uh, I mean, it, it is worth saying that it depends where you live, right? If you're living in Canada, I, my suspicion is that would be very difficult to do, right? The, the tax authorities, are relatively sophisticated. Um, and if you had large amounts of money flowing into your bank account without explanation, uh, people would get suspicious, right? Because the CRA would see that kind of thing. Uh, but if you lived in Ghana, right? If you lived in Kenya, if you lived uh, even in Indonesia for that matter, right? The tax authorities don't have the same kind of infrastructure and monitoring power uh, in place to monitor what's happening. And in those contexts, it's just that much easier to do all of these kinds of things uh, because it's very hard for tax authorities to monitor people's money. Um, in a lot of countries, for example, there are much more limited laws on the ability of tax authorities to see people's bank account information, to look at transfers in and out of their bank accounts. Uh, when that's true, it then just becomes much, much easier to transfer money uh, internationally or potentially back. Um, anyway, I hope that gets at the question. Aren't yes, sir. Aren't banks only required to report transactions of a million dollars or more? Uh, I think much smaller than that, actually. Are you sure? I think so, but I am not 100% sure, but I've got a nodding head here. So okay, I... well, I'll go with, with the nodding head, but I thought for a long time that it was a million, <laughs> and, and you simply then transferred 999,000, and, and uh, it, it wouldn't have to be reported. I can tell you, I've had personal experience of a bank, a large Canadian bank, being more than willing, willing, willing to move money from a tax haven back to Toronto and guarantee that it wouldn't be detected. So the banks play a major role, I would argue, in facilitating the return of the money, which is the reason why I put the question to you. I think that's how a lot of the money gets back, is not through major transactions. The, the, the wealthy people of Toronto don't ask for a million dollars to be sent back to their bank account, but they might ask for 900,000 to be sent back, which doesn't have to be reported. And the banks, as I understand it, can facilitate the movement of that money through a series of accounts that are untraceable and that they actually facilitate. So I would say, one, that's a very interesting example. Um, and, and, and sort of the broad contours of what you're describing, I think we have plenty of evidence worldwide that in many cases, in many countries, banks have at least somewhat knowingly engaged in facilitating these kinds of activities. Um, so it, it, what you're describing is entirely plausible and demonstrated in various settings. Um, in terms of the specifics, uh, I think the rules around sort of the reporting of large financial transactions are much stricter now than they used to be. Um, a lot of that's been driven not by tax rules, but by anti-money laundering rules. Um, so under the Financial Action Task Force, uh, they've tightened rules around those kinds of things quite substantially. There's much tighter monitoring. I actually thought that the reporting requirements were maybe $10,000 or more in these transfers. Um, but it may be somewhat larger than that. Uh, now, that doesn't mean those all get checked, right? But uh, but you do keep track of those kinds of things. But that doesn't preclude making lots of transfers of $9,000. Exactly. Um, and so one of the ways you know, of getting money offshore or back is just small transactions. Um, the trouble is, I think, with 
the trouble from the perspective of the tax evader is if ever you were suspected, the CRA then would be able to look into your details in more detail and they would see that paper trail, right? So you might prefer not to do that because once you were caught, then all of that is sitting there in front of them. Whereas if you can keep the money offshore, even if you were audited, it may be that that stuff remains hidden. Um, so that's that's my general sense. But again, uh, I don't want to go too far down this road because I wouldn't claim to be the world's expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you nodded your head before. Did what I just said sound broadly right? Oh, yes. I think that the banks have tightened up in the last 10 years. They've had a lot of uh, regulations forced upon them, particularly with respect to money laundering, yeah. which would catch real transfers as well. Great. So I, I feel reassured. Uh, here in the front, another question. Um, question about the recent measures in taken in Brazil. Um, is it possible to make a parallel with what happens in Brazil versus in Italy during the clean hands operation? Uh, unfortunately, I cannot answer that question because I don't know about the clean hands operation in Italy. Um, the my suspicion is perhaps not, only because as far as I know, what Brazil has done is relatively unique, but it's also very long standing. And so maybe it's worth just in relation to that question clarifying for whoever asked the question. You know, Brazil has employed highly simplified methods to combat to, get, to combat profit shifting through transformist pricing for almost 30 years now. Uh, and so essentially in the wake of their new constitution in the late 1980s, uh, they put in place this set of rules, uh, which has been in force ever since. Um, those rules have always been technically in violation of OECD rules, uh, but Brazil has continued to use them anyway. Um, but the crux of what Brazil does, uh, in case anyone else is interested in this, um, you know, is OECD rules say you have to value each of those transactions between subsidiaries of a multinational for transfer pricing purposes. Brazil has sort of said, to hell with it. That's too hard to do. We can't do it effectively. So we are just going to establish a fixed profit margin for companies by sector. Um, and we are going to apply that fixed profit margin to their total growth revenues. Um, so it's highly simplified, but it means, you know, for example, if you are a retailer, the fixed profit margin might be 20%. I don't actually know what they use. And so they would take all the revenues of you as a retailer and apply a 20% profit, uh, profit margin and tax that profit. So it doesn't matter if you've transferred all your wealth offshore because they're focusing on revenues, which aren't then susceptible to the same kind of profit shifting and transformation pricing. Um, but again, those rules are very long standing. As I said, there's now some pressure on Brazil to change those rules uh, as part of their negotiations to join the OECD. Um, the OECD has essentially said, if you want to join the OECD, you must change your rules. Um, but I th again, I think that's quite unique. And I'm sorry, though, I don't know about the Italian case. Yes. Uh, a lot of uh, what you're discussing may or may not be legal. Like uh, some of it is legal, it's within the framework of the law. Do you have any sense to uh, what proportion of the lost revenue is due to illegality compared to what is lost due to uh, lack of appropriate uh, legislation? So that is a complicated question. Uh, I think it's sort of it's one of those gray areas that you know, tax people always debate, right? So, you know, is it is it tax avoidance, which is, you know, within the framework of the law, but maybe of sort of questionable morality, or is it tax evasion, which is obviously illegal? Um, I think the answer in some ways is easier in relation to wealthy individuals. Um, insofar as for a wealthy individual, if you have income earned offshore, and you don't pay taxes, that is illegal full stop, right? That it, it just is. But if the corporation that's offshore earns uh, money and pays corporation tax on it, but it doesn't come out of the corporation, is that taxable in Canada? So that is a question that I will not venture to try to answer. Um, but uh, but I think generally speaking, certainly if it's if it is personal wealth held offshore. So if you own stocks and bonds offshore, they earn revenue. That revenue is accruing to you as an individual, and you're not paying taxes. That's clearly illegal. Uh, most estimates that are out there, um, none of which are completely up to date, but are relatively recent, suggest that somewhere between 80 and 95% of all of that wealth held offshore that I described doesn't pay taxes. Um, and that reflects studies, for example, of, of bank accounts held in Switzerland, um, for which upward of 80% weren't paying taxes as of a few years ago, at least. Um, you know, again, for high income countries, that might improve under the new rules, one could easily imagine. Uh, but I think, again, those are studies that remain to be done. Um, for multinational corporations, I think it's much murkier. Uh, 
And again, this isn't just for your benefit, for everyone's, right? If you think about that arm's length principle, right? There is in, in theory some appropriate price at which to price transactions between two subsidiaries of the same multinational. Let's say that abstract right price, if we could figure it out is $8, but we don't really know. So if you set the price at $7.50, even though you suspect maybe the right price is $8, is that illegal or is that just sort of pushing the envelope of legality? Hard to know, right? It's hard to know where the limit is at which you've abused transformist pricing so much that it is obviously illegal as opposed to sort of an honest mistake or your effort to take full advantage of the law within the law or whatever other sort of euphemisms we might use. And I think it is worth saying that at some level, this is hard for multinational corporations too, right? I mean, we do want to be even handed for a multinational corporation themselves. They don't know what that price is because for them, it's just an internal transaction. They're being asked to price it. And so naturally they will price it in the most advantageous way possible for their own interests while trying broadly to respect the law, but probably pushing up against the limits of where they think the law ends, right? Um, so it's, it's hard to say when you've stepped over that line, I think. Um, but there are other things that corporations do that are, I think, more obviously illegal, but I couldn't begin to venture what the sort of percentages are. I just sort of like to ask a different question. Yeah. Um, what, uh, are there not a lot of factors that cause some individuals to uh, put their money offshore that are not economic? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so maybe in answering that question, it's worth sort of circling back to circling back to where I started, right? So estimates suggest that 80 to 95% of money held offshore is tax avoiding. That of course suggests that, you know, somewhere between five and 20% is not tax avoiding um, or evading. It's there for other reasons, right? Um, and I think there are a host of other reasons. Uh, there are a host of reasons why people might put money offshore. Uh, I wouldn't try to get at all of them, but when we think about this problem globally, I think the most obvious reason people put money offshore uh, is because they don't trust their governments and they'd rather not have the, that revenue not be accessible to their governments in case their governments turn on them effectively, right? And I, my suspicion is that that argument tends to be overused by those who would like to defend the existing system, right? That is for the vast majority of wealthy taxpayers, even in low-income countries, your government isn't coming after you. They aren't trying to confiscate your bank accounts. That does happen, but it doesn't happen routinely or in all countries. Um, but in some countries, it does happen. Uh, and I think in those countries, you know, there's a legitimate argument to be made that people wisely want to keep some money offshore. I mean, just to take one example, uh, and I'm sort of morally agnostic about who's right and who's wrong in this story, but just to say, you know, in Saudi Arabia, obviously, in recent years or in recent months, the government has cracked down aggressively uh, on all kinds of business people and politicians who it is accused of corruption, uh, which has included confiscating assets, right? Assets held offshore are not confiscatable in the same way. Um, and so insofar as you think the people who have been accused of corruption are not guilty, it's a good thing that they can keep their money offshore. Uh, insofar as you think that they are guilty, it's a bad thing that they can keep their money offshore. Um, and it's hard to know where you sort of draw that line. Uh, but again, coming back to this question of data sharing, you know, you could imagine that at some level, Canada might, Canada, as an example, might reasonably say, we don't think we should share the information about taxpayers abroad back to country X, because we have extensive evidence that, that country is, in fact, confiscating the assets of its political opponents, right? Again, again, that's a thing that does happen in some countries. And in those cases, you know, anonymity in offshore is probably not a bad thing. Um, I just suspect that that's, that's a small minority of cases, um, which is then often used as a justification for the broader system, uh, which primarily is just benefiting wealthy people who would rather not be taxed. Um, but again, that's sort of a personal opinion. Yes. Taking this back to your initial research around development in Africa, what does the net effect have on development in Africa? And what is the potential, let's say, if you could cast a spell and look 10 years down the road and things have changed, um, what does development in Africa look like because things have changed? Huh, okay. So I have to think about how to answer that question best. So in a world where you could just sort of cast a spell, so let's you know eliminate all the political constraints of the real world on taking action, you know, in some sense, I think I would just use the numbers I presented earlier, right? You'd, you would plug all those loopholes that wealthy individuals and corporations are using to avoid taxes. Um, I think if you did that, if you could do that for corporations and you could do that for individuals, 
you would probably find that tax revenues in low-income countries on average, uh, most of which, but not all of which are in Africa, would increase by something like 30%, give or take. But is it that ballpark, right? So if low-income countries from tomorrow onward had 30% more revenue to play with, um, they could do a lot of stuff, right? That is, you could do a lot of things. Uh, that's the kind of revenue that would allow, you know, broad expansions of healthcare, education, infrastructure spending, et cetera. Um, and would have all kinds of knock-on effects uh, from doing that. Uh, I think, you know, in doing that, if you wiped out some of the structures and tax havens, some of the secrecy associated with tax havens, you would also reduce incentives for high level official corruption uh, because it would be much harder for corrupt public officials to move their money offshore, to hide it, et cetera. Um, so potentially you'd see improvements in the quality of governance in a lot of these countries because the incentives for corruption would decline. Um, of course, you might not, right? Corrupt officials might just steal the money and keep it at home. Uh, so you don't know exactly what would happen. Uh, but I think there's a reasonable suspicion uh, that you'd have some, some improvement in corruption as well because it would be harder to engage in those kinds of activities. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't change everything, but I think those would be really, really substantial changes, right? Uh, the road towards raising 30% more tax revenue in most African countries is a long one. Uh, so if you could change this overnight, uh, you'd achieve an, an enormous gain. And of course, you'd achieve that gain primarily by taxing the very, very wealthy and by taxing foreign corporations that aren't paying very much tax, um, both of which are probably relatively good ways of raising revenue as opposed to taxing sort of relatively lower income people. Um, so I guess that's what it could look like. Realistically, even in the sort of best case scenario in all of this in the real world, you wouldn't get that much, right? That is, uh, I think, under any reasonable set of assumptions about what's going to happen in the next 10 years or 20 years, you know, the corporate tax rules that have been passed, even if they were to go further, maybe you'd capture half of the corporate tax revenue that's missing, but certainly not all of it. Uh, with high net worth individuals, you know, I think you can aspire to capture some of that wealth. You'd probably never capture quite all of it, uh, at least in the immediate term. But you could still imagine a world in which you know, plausibly countries could increase their tax revenues by 15%. Again, that's a lot of money, right? It could make a really big difference in a lot of ways. Um, so that's maybe a more realistic um, pursuit. I think the broader question for low-income countries is, and this is really not for people interested in international tax, but in interested in developing countries is, what's the right balance between trying to do the kinds of things I've described here today and just trying to strengthen your domestic tax system in general, right? Uh, even if you closed all of these loopholes, most of the tax revenue collection in developing countries, like in developed countries, comes from other sources that aren't international in any way, right? It comes from domestic income taxes, sale taxes, property taxes, taxes on domestic firms, and so on. Um, and so I think one of the things that low-income countries, as I alluded to, are wrestling with now is what's the best way to increase revenues, right? Is it to keep pushing and pushing and pushing to tax high net worth individuals and multinational firms that continue to be very hard to tax? Uh, or does the right answer lie in trying to tax uh, other tax bases that might be more readily available at home? Um, and then underpinning all of this in the real, real world is the question of politics as I alluded to, right? Just because you can tax wealthy people doesn't necessarily mean that you will. Um, and so there's a sort of looming question in the background of even if these rules all worked better, would governments then exploit these rules to their maximum extent in order to raise as much revenue as possible? Or might there be groups that still don't pay that many taxes because governments don't want to tax them for political reasons or because they don't want to tax multinational corporations because of concerns about tax competition and wanting to attract foreign investment, right? There's a whole host of other factors that sort of filter in. You know, my personal view of this then as we get closer to the real world is get a set of rules that work and then leave it to countries to then decide whether they're gonna apply them or not because their decision to apply them or not will then be much more transparent, right? In a world in which the rules don't work at all, um, it's quite hard to know exactly what's going on and countries don't even have the option of raising that revenue even if they wanted to. Um, and so they're sort of off the hook as well and it obscures a lot of what might else be going on. Um, so I, I don't know if that quite gets at your question, but I hope it's in the ballpark. Yes. Um, I'm interested in how progress gets made. And you've uh, occasionally said, well, this is better than it was. You, you, there, it's as if there is some progress being made, although you have your doubts about how fast. And it sounded as, as if a lot of it was coming from the OECD. Is that the main source of progress? And if so, please explain how that happens. What is there in the OECD that would, would cause that kind of progress? 
is there some, I mean, who, who's doing it? Who's pulling the strings? Yes. And in fact, I don't know beans about the OECD anyway. I've, I've heard it all, you know, many, many years, but I don't even know where it came from or who's in it or what they do or anything. So tell, tell me everything. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best to be brief. Um, the, so, I mean, the OECD is sort of a broad sort of technical economic coordinating <laughs> body for OECD countries, which is largely, but now not exclusively, sort of the large Western countries in Europe, North America and Australia and Japan. But then since then, you know, Chile's joined, South Korea's joined, uh, and other sort of larger uh, middle income countries are trying to join as well. Um, in terms of whether the OECD has sort of been driving change, I guess it depends what you mean by driving change. Uh, the OECD has been the host for the negotiation of the BEPS project, um, which has then issued recommendations about the reform of international rules. Um, that's just simply because the OECD has always been the sort of global hub for the negotiation of international rules. So the guidelines that sort of define the parameters of the international tax system, as I've described it, are guidelines published by the OECD going back to the 1960s. Um, and that sort of reflects that that is where the large Western countries sort of did business in setting economic policy uh, between them. Um, so this has all happened at the OECD. Uh, but I don't think that answers the question of what's driving the change. Um, because I think the, the big push for change has probably come from outside of the OECD. Uh, you know, there are some good people within the OECD. I think there are people who have really believed deeply in reform. Um, but they sort of take their cues from their member states uh, and increasingly from the G20 in, in setting their agenda and in and pursuing reform. So then the question is, where has the sort of pressure for reform come from? I think that's probably what you're really getting at. Um, and there, I think, probably the answer is it comes from two types of places. Um, I think the less interesting one is it comes out of the global financial crisis, right? After the global financial crisis, in some ba very basic sense, countries needed revenue uh, because they suddenly had big bills to pay off and they had less revenue because of the recession. Um, and so I think the, the global financial crisis served to sort of focus the mind uh, of governments on the need to raise more revenue. Uh, and I think there was growing recognition from research and elsewhere that, uh, that this was an increasing problem and an increasing source of lost revenues. Um, but I think the other and much more interesting part of this story uh, has been the rise of sort of very impressive and, and effective uh, civil society organizations um, lobbying on tax issues uh, and essentially lobbying for the, what they would describe as the fair application of tax rules to multinational corporations uh, and to wealthy individuals. Um, I think in sort of broad terms, though this is also the name of an organization, uh, this is sort of referred to as the tax justice movement. Um, one of the key organizations has been the Tax Justice Network, um, but other organizations have also played a very important role. Um, but I think they found that this became a really sort of important justice issue, right? Insofar as the sort of largest corporations in the world and the wealthiest people in the world weren't paying what most people would consider their fair share of taxes relative to everyone else, um, there was a strong case to be made uh, that that was deeply unfair um, and that solving that problem would have really important uh, benefits uh, for individual nations, but potentially also for sort of global development and solving broader global problems. Um, I think when that started, we were talking about very small numbers of people who had backgrounds in accountancy, some of whom had been involved in the sort of tax havens industry, uh, broadly defined, who began to sort of move this forward. And then I think it, it spread and it spread and it spread. Um, and over time, it just became a very large public campaign. Uh, it's been probably particularly effective in the United Kingdom initially, I think that's where the hub of a lot of this was, but it progressively spread elsewhere to Canada, to the United States, throughout Europe, uh, throughout Africa, throughout Latin America, and sort of caught on. Um, and so I think that public pressure, you know, my own view is that public pressure has been really essential to moving this up the sort of political agenda such that governments had to take it seriously and had to consider uh, pursuing real reform um, to improve it. So, you know, it's I think it is a story of a real civil society success story. Uh, on an issue that 10 years ago did not seem like it was an obvious place for civil society advocacy, given, as I said at the outset, technical, dull, hard to understand, hard to engage with. Um, but they've done it anyway. Um, and I think, uh, you know, some of the people involved with that are, are close colleagues of mine, and I've always been immensely impressed by the work that they've done. Um, connected with this um, No, not connected with our research effort. That is, I know them through the research, um, but they are, you know, sort of separation of, of, uh, uh, of uh, church and state, so to speak, right? The researchers, we look at what they're doing and try to assess it. Uh, we talk to them, uh, but we sort of try to remain independent of their work. Um, 
and and they have tried to draw on our work when useful, but have have worked to sort of move the agenda forward. Who are so I think the tax justice network is is for my money probably the most important. Um, there are now various coalitions, but I can't put my finger on the names of all those coalitions as I as I stand here. But then some also the sort of big development NGOs have also been involved. So Ox, Oxfam, Christian Aid, Action Aid, um, sort of on the development side of this. Um, Global Financial Integrity was one of the first NGOs working on this in the United States and in North America. Um, so all very, very impressive organizations. Um, and, and again, to me, quite remarkable that they succeeded in moving moving these kinds of issues up up the sort of global agenda. Uh, yes, another question. Um, do you have a new book available, um, Tax Responsiveness and Accountability? I do. Um, and where can we purchase it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you and everyone in the room uh, can publish it uh, through uh, through Cambridge University Press is the is the publisher of the book. Um, so that's probably the first place to look. I imagine you can purchase it most easily directly through them. Um, uh, yes, book sales would be great. I, I, I should warn, and I shouldn't say this because this is a terrible thing to say when you're trying to sell a book. My, uh, <laughs> uh, not that. <laughs> the, uh, no, but actually, actually only that that book, I feel like I have to disclose this. That book is not really about the things I've talked about just now. Um, it is about issues about taxation uh, and accountability for the way those revenues are used. Uh, within countries uh, in Africa. That's where my research focus has been. Um, I do, though, have a new book coming out in July, uh, which is called Taxing Africa through Zed Books, uh, which does deal with a lot of the stuff I talked about today. Um, anyway, thank you for the question. Please, please go back to the live stream and, and add uh, information about your new book um, as a comment to it. Okay, I will do that. Excellent. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, other questions? Uh, we have one at the back here. Um, I heard that the uh, U.S. is demanding the Canadian banks report back to them uh, about U.S. citizens' activities here. They, I think they're doing it. How do they get the nerve to do that? Is it legal? Well, so, so I guess there's two parts to that question, circling back to what I've talked about here. I mean, in terms of how they did it, um, in a quite general sense, and I, I think I suspect the details are a little more sophisticated than this, but in a general sense, the U.S. said, if you foreign banks want to do business in the United States, then you must share this information with us, full stop. Uh, and because the United States is such an incredibly important financial market, all of the banks said then, okay, we will share the data with you because we can't afford to be locked out of the U.S. market. Um, and so the U.S. is really uniquely positioned to make that kind of a threat because it's a big enough and important enough financial market that all the banks sort of had to go along with it because they needed access. Um, you know, and you could imagine that if, if this had escalated further, the U.S. would have all kinds of other leverage it might try to apply to force both countries and, and individual financial institutions to comply. Um, so that's how it does it. Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, the broad... The broader issue of doing that, right, as, as I described here, right, the reform aimed at automatic exchange of information is aimed at the idea that tax, that financial institutions in all countries should share that information with their tax authorities, and those tax authorities should share it with their counterparts in other countries, right? So if a Canadian has large bank accounts in the United States, those financial institutions should share it with the U.S. tax authorities, and the U.S. tax authorities should share that with Canadian authorities. And most countries in the world have agreed now to do that, uh, although it hasn't actually started to happen yet. Um, and, you know, my gut tells me that's a really important and good thing, right? That's a hugely important part of how you try to curb the kinds of abuses we've described. Uh, the problem is that the U.S. so far has said we will get the information. They have not yet agreed to share the information. Um, you know, various individual countries are negotiating with the U.S. to try to get a reciprocal agreement, agreement in place. I can only imagine that the Canadian government is trying to do the same. Um, but so far, the United States has certainly not agreed to do it multilateral with all countries. Um, they may eventually do that bilaterally with some countries. Um, but from a sort of global welfare perspective, you can see the problems if, if the United States isn't willing to share data equally back to the countries that share data with it. Um, so that's the broad story as far as I understand it. Uh, other things? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I arrived late, so I only got part of your presentation. I have the feeling, myself, and I certainly don't claim to be any expert, that 
Um, very often, people who are presumed to be very knowledgeable on world politics and economics and make things which are fundamentally very straightforward, very complicated. I remember many years ago when I was doing my graduate work in political science and economics, it seemed to be so complicated and obscure that it would take a lifetime to get the hang of it. But I like, and I feel now in my advanced age, <laughs> that I'm in a, more of a position uh, to understand the basic things uh, that I didn't understand at all then. One of which is, for example, and it comes out in a very popular song, is nothing sure the rich get rich and the poor get poorer. And I think that that is the case. And these are some of the things that I believe we need to understand and act upon. You might like to make a few comments about that. Yes. Well, let me let me pick up the sort of the the first part of the question, which I think is the sort of the piece maybe that uh, I find most interesting, which is about you know this idea of complexity and whether these things are actually as complex as they seem, right? Um, I guess the short answer is I absolutely 100% share your sense that these things are often made out to be more complex than they really are. Um, and that's often convenient because it reduces the ability of other people to engage in discussion of them, right? Uh, if, if you are a tax expert, it sort of behooves you to make tax issues seem really complicated because that means you get to make decisions and other people don't. Uh, and I think to be fair, I don't want to suggest that everyone who is a tax lawyer or a tax accountant is setting out there saying, I'm going to make this as complicated as possible to exclude other people. I think often this happens implicitly, right? The, the nature of the discourses we have, the nature of the meetings that are organized is such that they are set up to be hugely complicated. That's what people are used to. Those are the kinds of questions people are used to engaging with. And so it, it is sort of a self-reinforcing process that people don't necessarily think about, but the effect is exactly what you described, right? It's... It, uh, it is ultimately exclusionary uh, and makes it very hard for people to engage. Um, I mean, to give a sort of very obvious example, right? I can sit here and talk about international tax issues. I'd like to think I can think about them in a sort of meaningful way. That said, if I were to go to most of the international consultations around international tax reform, I would find it almost impossible to engage because the level of technical detail that tends to be brought into those discussions is impenetrable to a non-expert, right? And, and in the legal and accountancy sense, I'm not an expert either. Um, and so I think one of the remarkable things that sort of civil society activists working on these issues have achieved has been trying to demystify these issues, right? Trying to simplify them in a way that sort of people could engage with them. And obviously in simplifying, you do lose some of the details. And, and sometimes you then need to circle back to those details and get them right. It's not that the details don't matter. Um, but I think being able to simplify these things down to sort of their essence is really important. Uh, it's really important to allowing people to engage. It's also just really important sometimes to sort of cut through all the complexity and figure out what the root of the problem is. Um, I think sometimes we can lose sight of sort of the bigger challenge when we get too focused on, on the finer details. Um, and so I think, I think it was before you came in, but one of the things I did mention uh, as I talked is this idea that to me, but this is a sort of very personal view, is my hope is that over time, there might be some push to do more of that, right? To, to simplify the rules themselves, certainly to simplify the discussion around them, um, to allow broader popular engagement, but also to help low-income countries themselves to engage with these rules and to implement them more effectively. Um, because I think the complexity, whether intentional or unintentional, makes them hard to implement, it makes it hard to engage, and that affects low-income countries most acutely uh, in practice. Um, but I think, again, that simplification is difficult in part because there are so many people who consciously or unconsciously are invested in the complexity um, and potentially benefit from that complexity, right? Uh, the multinationals that manage to avoid taxes benefit from the complexity of the rules because it allows them to sort of run circles around poor tax administrations who can't quite keep up, right? Wealthy individuals benefit from the complexity because those are the very loopholes that they exploit in order to hide money offshore and so on and so on and so on. Um, so yes, I'm a big believer in simplification where it's possible. Um, without sort of avoiding completely the importance of, of details where they're really needed. Uh, so I appreciate the question. I agree with you entirely. Um, and if, if we can convince more people of that, we'll be in maybe a better place. Um, other things? 
Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. I did not talk about him, no. As simplifying what's happening and how Canada has tried to close the loopholes, but it seems that even the finance minister and the conservative government hasn't been able to, um, you know, each time they tried, somehow they it just didn't happen. Uh, yeah, so the question was about uh, Dennis Howlett, who I believe is the, well, let's say the director, that might not be the right title, of Canadians for Tax Fairness, right. is that right? Yes. Um, and uh, a comment on a video of his, which uh, was suggested has been very successful in sort of simplifying um, what these debates are about um, uh, for sort of a broad audience to understand, uh, in, the, in the Canadian context in particular. Uh, so all I would say is... Uh, I would endorse seeing that video then. I should probably see it myself. Uh, I think that, and I think that kind of work is really important. Um, I think it is worth saying, going back to the earlier question, as far as I understand, uh, Canadians for Tax Fairness is part of the broader global tax justice network of which I spoke earlier. And so they've been very much part of this broader process within civil society of trying to demystify these issues, trying to put them on the public radar and trying to push for change, um, which uh, to reemphasize what I said earlier, I think it's just been hugely, hugely important. Um, and uh, so the more we want to talk about that good work, the better. Uh, other questions? Let's make this the last one. Last question. Okay. There isn't anything else from the web. Okay. Is there anything else from the web? There's, there's at least 44 um, viewers on the web tonight. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, if there's no more questions, then uh, thank you very much to everyone for listening. Uh, <laughs> sure that you would keep us fascinated but you sure did i was sitting on the edge of my seat the whole time weren't you guys yeah anyway fascinating and extremely important i want to say that uh, you know after we uh, have these lectures i always invite the speaker out for supper at the prenup pub and those of you who feel still engaged in this issue and want to keep plying him with questions are, are welcome to join us over there it's a uh, it's a Belgian uh, pub that sells very good beer, and uh, you're welcome to join us. Um, and I'll tell you how to get there if you're interested in coming along. Uh, I want to mention that next week we have another uh, a talk in this series. It's a little different in that it isn't immediately connected with the um, How to Save the World in a Hurry project because it's about genocide, and that's one of the, the, the potential threats to humankind that just doesn't happen to make it onto the list of six. But it is obviously something that uh, we all need to think about and, uh, and worry about. I mean, I, I think there are probably places in the world today that you could say what's going on is genocide against certain kinds of refugees. I think maybe the Rohingya might be called a, a case of genocide now, I don't know. But that's worthwhile uh, considering. So Maya Katic is going to be the speaker. She is a, I don't know what her role is. She's teaching a professor somehow at the um, Canadian Forces College in the, uh, she's connected to the Royal Military College, you know, but it's a forces college for mostly senior um, officers and so on up on North, uh, North uh, Toronto, uh, Young Boulevard, I think. So uh, she's, she teaches uh, courses on genocide. And um, uh, you, if you come back next week uh, at 7 o'clock, uh, we'll have another very interesting conversation. Thank you, Wilson. This is just wonderful. And uh, it's going to – absolutely, you're going to have people studying this as if – they were cramming for an exam. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Okay, see you next week.